having been in a band in my youth, I thought I would move to New York, get a record deal, and uh, and live happily ever after. But through the course of my career, it started that I began working with friends on their records. I never wound up getting signed myself, which was fine. And over time, I began doing demos with people, and then an early band that I worked with was Maggie's Dream, uh, when Len Lenny Kravitz was the singer. And they wound up getting signed to um, Capitol Records. Uh, Robbie Rosa went on to become the official singer. And that was really my first uh, proper record album project. Before that, I'd done programming gigs on for people like M. Tumay, Isley, Jasper Isley, but the Maggie's Dream thing kind of got me into the mainstream. And from then on, I began engineering and then slowly worked up to producing. And now I'm happy producing, engineering, mixing, writing, uh, so it's it's been good. It seems more than ever now the producer, engineer, mixer, artist relationship has become more individual, where people seem to be looking for someone that can best bring out whatever it is that they are, whatever it is the essence of the artist is, and I think anybody now is going to check and ask friends, ask other people about somebody or how was it like, what was it like working with this person, I think that becomes a more um, determining factor in how people select who they're going to work with, where in the past it was who can we get that's available, and sometimes you wouldn't really even meet, but now because budgets are tight each project becomes so much more important that people are spending more time doing homework and getting to know who they're going to work with. Um, which is good for the artist because they have more control and, and can make a better choice for themselves, which I think ultimately serves everybody better. Once you have a bunch of people in the room who actually want to work together, it's better than getting into the studio and then finding out, well, this isn't quite right. I mean, I've been called into projects to, on the other end, to help clean up something, and it's always a bit uncomfortable, so mm -hmm. it's, in some ways it's helped to make the process better from start to finish. A lot of the times I have found, particularly with singers, if they're, apart from, from the lights and the mood and, and all of that, I've, I've found that if the singers are having trouble singing, then there's something that's wrong with the track or their mix. It's either the instrumentation is wrong, their headphone mix isn't right, the drums are too loud, so it's not always the singer, sometimes it's me or what they're hearing or not hearing. And sometimes that means adjusting the mix, sometimes it means redoing a track because the tempo or the key or the arrangement's not right for them. So I try to look at what I'm doing first and not necessarily blame the singer first because singing and for good singers it's such a sensitive thing for them if they can't feel the track or respond to it it means that I'm not doing something right or there's something inherently not right with what they're hearing so I try to do that and most of the time that works even if they can't express it which a lot of times they can't it's just not they can't sing to it. I think in the beginning with a new artist sometimes you don't want to bring them into some place that's going to be intimidating to them. Um, even in the case of Alana with her first record she was very young and we got into the studio and then all of a sudden she was out in the live room and she either had to sing or, or, or play her guitar and it wasn't a comfortable environment so we went back to my house to do a lot of that type of nuts and bolts work and then as she became more comfortable with the process and we came back to the studio and then that became a comfort zone for her. So it really depends and that's why in the beginning either for tracking or overdubbing or vocal recording I'll take the artists around to a variety of studios to see where they feel comfortable. Mixing is a different story. Um, that's usually to be able to come here is is really worth spending the money on. But for younger artists, different people have, like anyone else, are comfortable in different types of environments. If it's truly a band and they've been gigging 
and they've been doing it for a long time, then that's the best way to do it. And then you can, if you need to edit, you can ed edit together full takes and just punch the few spots that need to be punched. Um, a lot of the times now that's not quite possible. Bands are new, they're not used to playing every day in someone's garage or basement. Every weekend, it's, um, it's a different world. It's a total band thing. That's the best possible way. They get used to working at home on their own Pro Tools setups or garage band and they figure out how to make themselves sound good without actually playing on their instrument for hours and hours every day the way you really need to, to learn the instrument and to learn how to play mm -hmm. or to sing. It's just a different world. I mean, back in the old days, you were lucky if you had a four-track porta studio, you know, because the cassette-based machine, but you still had, you couldn't do the things now, uh, then that you can now. Some years ago, I recorded Bernard Purdy and Anthony Jackson. I mean, I worked with them a bunch of times, but on one particular song, Anthony came into the control room, he said, solo the kick drum, the cowbell, and my bass. Because he was hearing something, and we got to the B section, and every time we got to the B section, Bernard would push the kick drum ahead of the click a little bit. And then the chorus would come, and he'd settle back down behind the, the cowbell. And Anthony said, see, I knew it. Because he wanted, Anthony is such a perfectionist, he wanted to hear for himself what it was, but Bernard gave it that feel to push going into the cor chorus and then lay back in the chorus. But you can't really, you can't program that. I mean, you can, but it's not the same as having Bernard feel the song that way and do it. There's no machine ever that's going to do that. There's no machine that's going to reprodu reproduce a drummer playing in a live room and microphones and all that. When I s started mixing, there was no effective automation. So you'd mix in passes, and we'd mix to half inch, and then tape the song together in the edit room, and everyone was had or two or three people, and it was a performance on the console. You couldn't get it; it was never the same, and it was kind of performance-based mixing. Where now, of course, it's everything is perfect all the time, or you can refine it to an infinite degree. So yeah, the limitations allow the, in some ways, the imperfections, is really, what drives the art in a way. Or someone, if you listen to Neil Young sing, he's not a classical singer, but what comes out of him is just, amazingly beautiful and haunting. So those imperfections really what make it, beautiful in a way. I play. I write, I'm signed to Famous Music as a songwriter, I engineer, and I produce, so I don't rely on any one of the disciplines to kind of A, to make me happy, B, to make a living, as long as I can help contribute and different people and different projects need focus in one area or another, whether it's from the songwriting or the playing end, I can sit with someone in pre-production and we can play and write and record and then take it all the way through and I can mix it for them. So I think when people come to me they're comfortable that I can provide kind of a wide range of help um, in more of a kind of one-on-one. -on -one. I tend to work more with singer-songwriters, although I've done plenty of work with bands. Um, my last big band was Aerosmith which was a great experience, uh, but that was strictly engineering, so, uh, but it was kind of a, that was a great thing.